I'll be giving what I what I hope to be a standard length uh, uh, seminar. In other words, I hope I don't go on and on. <laughs> so, um, okay. So, uh, here is the front page of our brand new uh, website, which will be launched soon, including our brand new. Uh, uh, I mean, it's the same logo, but it's been it's been uh, beautified, and so uh, isn't that uh, uh, that great? And uh, okay, so let's start out with um, our keyword pro social. That's anything oriented towards the welfare of others or society as a whole. That might be an attitude, a behavior, a process, an institution, and pro social world. Our organization now entering its third year dedicated to promoting pro-sociality in all of its forms. And you know, there's so many pro-social organizations. Um, we have a differentiator, which is that our approach is based on modern evolutionary uh, science. And so what I wanna cover today is uh, first of all, my journey to pro-social world, and I'm an old guy, so, so uh, my journey is 50 years long, how long I've been um, a, uh, um, evolutionary scientist, and then that will lead to the current state and the future of pro-social world. Why begin my personal with my personal journey? It's because it's part of the history of evolutionary thought over the last 50 years, and we really need to understand the historical context for explaining the uniqueness of pro-social world in the um, in the um, present. And so um, everyone knows this. Uh, uh, utterance by uh, Theodosius Dobzhansky, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. We love to quote it. Uh, it, was, um, it was the title of a very short article that I wrote for biology teachers. And I was a graduate student then in my third year of graduate school. I, I was unaware of that paper, but I was living it. I was experiencing what Dobzhansky was talking about because prior to that, like in the first half of the 20th century, then fields, disciplines such as ecology, evolution, and behavior were historically separate disciplines. And what was taking place now, along with the mechanistic branches of biology, such as genetics and molecular biology, was that they were fusing into a single discipline. And departments were now renaming themselves EEB um, for ecology, evolution, and behavior. And so whereas I entered graduate school, thinking I was going to be an aquatic ecologist studying zooplankton to the end of my days, I quickly learned from the courses that I was teaching, uh, I was taking and, and, um, and the papers I was reading that I could be an anything ecologist. I could pick any organism, any topic, and there was some kind of conceptual toolkit that enabled me to ask the right questions leading ultimately to the gold standard of peer-reviewed publication. And everyone around me was doing the same thing. This was field wise. This had nothing to do with my own individual propensities. And as an example, other than myself, I'll pick out Richard Lensky, who's a little bit younger than me. He received his, uh, his uh, PhD in 1982, and he was studying ground beetles. He was an insect ecologist. But after getting his PhD, he realized that if he really wanted to study evolutionary ecology, he should be studying microbes. Because of course, they squeeze out six generations a day. And so he retooled, he uh, picked up the tools of microbiology and molecular biology, and then he conducted uh, world famous research on experimental evolution. Here he is, this is actually an old image, but uh, at that time, his experiment was 58,000 generations uh, strong. And I profile Richard in my book, This View of Life, Completing the Darwinian Revolution as an exemplar of uh, of uh, Tinbergen's four questions. So that's code. If you know what Tinbergen's four questions are, you're in. And if you don't, then you're still in. But I look forward to telling you. So uh, um, as Eliza Doolittle's father uh, said to Professor Harold, Harold Higgins, I'm wanting to tell you, I'm waiting to tell you, I'm wishing to tell you. And this is the norm in evolutionary biology. Uh, last summer, I was at the animal behavior meetings in San Jose, Costa Rica because my wife is a behavioral ecologist. 
And all of the hot young plenary speakers gave their talks and they said, well, in my plenary talk, I'm gonna tell you about the three different systems that I'm working on in my, in my laboratory. And so it's business as usual, but if you're not aware of it, or if you're not a biologist, it's incredible that, that there's this kind of transcendence of disciplinary uh, uh, boundaries. It's really something that we want to resensitize to about how amazing. But at the time, it did not extend to the study of humans. So here's another famous book from the 1970s, Sociobiology by Edward O. Wilson, the other Wilson, as I like to call him. And, um, and so its message was the same as Dobjansky's, and nothing about social behavior makes sense except in the light of evolution, acclaimed for the study of non-human species and hotly contested for the study of humans, as this book by the anthropologist Marshall Solon's The Use and Abuse of Biology. So, so applying this framework to humans was off limits in 1975, and the evolutionary biologists were themselves responsible for part of that, because something that happened in the history of evolution was that, although Darwin knew nothing about genes, and so he thought broadly about natural selection as any process that combined the ingredients of variation, selection, and replication, no matter what the mechanism, because he didn't know any mechanisms, once the mechanism of genetics was discovered, then the whole study of evolution became gene-centric, as if the only way that offspring resemble their parents is by sharing the same genes. And this is represented by this mosaic tile. Um, it's actually on a science building in Notre Dame University, where there's Dobjansky's famous statement. But look, it's surrounding a DNA helix, as if as if that's all there is to, to uh, inheritance. And this is patently false when stated outright, but it uh, describes the so-called modern synthesis. So leaving out cultural evolution, that means that people like Marshall Solins were right when they criticized Ed Wilson for being uh, genetically determinist, as uh, was the critique. And there was a large measure of, uh, of, uh, of truth to it. And so, um, hold on just one minute, please. I just discovered that I can... Uh, hide something and I have. So if we generalize Dobjansky's statement uh, to nothing about X makes sense in the light of, except in the light of evolution, where X might be biology, all human related disciplines, cultural evolution, and public policy and all other practical change efforts. What we can say is that expanding X beyond biology is extraordinarily recent. Starting in the last quarter of the 20th century, we might Mark sociobiology is that as that starting point. In many cases, the last 10 years, and we can begin to see why pro-social world is so distinctive, especially in its practical applications. <coughs> and one thing that needs to be said that addresses you know, the question that was asked earlier about evolutionary psychology is that while these disciplines in rethinking the human related disciplines got started after 1975, a lot of maturation was required. And so evolutionary psychology, you might say, began with the adapted mind in 1992. That image of the mind was, was something that was massively modular, a universal human nature that evolved by genetic evolution with culture, just a thin veneer. Um, and uh, now fast forward to the present, uh, we have books like Joe Henrik's two books, in which there's a rich appreciation of cultural diversity and a sense of humility that 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 95 percent, probably 99 percent of scientists, science and scholarship, has taken place in a in a in a particular culture that's peculiar compared to worldwide diversity, and so look at how far we come uh, uh, for the study of evolutionary psychology. Back then, the study of genetic evolution was highly, highly reductionistic, the selfish gene. And now it's become multi-level, much more holistic, systematic. And I'm proud to have played a role uh, in, that, uh, in, um, in that progression. Uh, the first book on economics from an evolutionary perspective in this era was the uh, uh, Nelson and uh, Winters and Evolutionary Theory of Economic Change. Nice start, but now 
If you look at the more recent contributions, such as Eric Beinhocker's Origin of Wealth and this own edited volume that I did with the uh, complexity economist, Alan Kerman, then we see just so much um, change has occurred. And so uh, this is a, a, an important thing to, to, to emphasize. Humility is called for. In science, we need a strange combination is that we need to be assertive that there are facts of the matter and that we have apprehended them to a degree. And that's extremely important to respect them, but that everything is provisional and subject to change at quite a large scale. So it's a combination of, of humility and assertiveness that's a balancing act. And very often, humility is lacking among, among, uh, among scientists. And so back to my own trajectory in the 1990s or 1980s and 1990s, I was still doing quite a lot of biological work. And let me just tell you about two of my own research programs. On the left here, we have a beetle. It's a carrion beetle that specializes on small carcasses, which it's exceptionally good at finding. And it buries them. So it's called the burying beetle. And then um, and then lays its brood and, and um, on, the, um, on the carcass. And what you also see here is that cluster of mites. Those mites are not parasitic. They're just using the beetle for transport. And so this is a relationship called foracy, the use of one species for transport by another species. Those mites are big enough so that you can see, but there's probably four or five other species of mites tucked in in nooks and crannies, plus nematodes, and of course, a dense, dense microbial ecosystem and the microbiome of the, of the beetle. And they all disembark when the beetle finds a carcass, they all reproduce and then climb back on the next generation of beetles. And I chose to study this system because it's a natural common pool resource situation. The beetle is a common pool resource for the phoretic, for the, for the species that use the beetle for transport. Just like the tragedy of the commons, what would happen if uh, these, uh, these species actually evolved to exploit the beetle as predators or parasites, or in any way interfere with the reproductive success of the beetle, then they would be limiting their own um, uh, transport. So their empirical question became, does this phoretic community harm or help or perhaps neutral the uh, beetles? And I think you can see the relationship between that uh, set of questions and what we're doing with humans in pro-social world. On the right, a very different system, a very different question is, uh, if you look at uh, this, uh, these sunfish were all captured from the same lake, and you can see that they differ. Some are much more deep bodied than others. Uh, often we think of species as inhabiting a single niche, and when they vary, it's a bell-shaped curve, and that the um, intermediate, the middle of the curve is what's adaptive. But another possibility is that uh, a single species, uh, let's say a single population of fish in a single lake, have specialized have into different niches. And so there's actually individual differences within the population that are similar to the differences that we expect between species. And that turns out to be correct. So the deep bodied fish here are specialized to the uh, edge of the lake, the littoral zone, and the more narrow bodied ones are specialized to the open water, the pelagic zone. So we can study um, single species in the same way that we're accustomed to studying um, uh, multi-species communities. And of course, the champion of that are humans. And look how diverse humans are. We're just, we're one species. And, and often, I mean, when we're interacting, we share the same language. We might speak, all be speaking English, for example, but we're doing and thinking very different things. And so how's it possible for there to be a, like a multi-species cultural ecosystem all sharing the same language? How does that work? And so, I think you can see how I was using the same toolkit, but spanning humans <laughs> and and other species um, effortlessly, basically. So, uh, so um, now many scientists don't like to teach. They try to do as much research as possible and as little teaching as, as possible. But uh, and I was actually a bit like that. But uh, I became passionate about teaching this more expansive form of evolution. And so when I got to my final academic resting home, Binghamton University, I started first to teach uh, evolution and human behavior. And then I started a campus-wide evolutionary studies program so that any student on campus could learn about 
um, this evolutionary uh, perspective, this expanded form of evolution. And so this was my first programmatic effort. I taught a course for non-majors that led to my book, Evolution for um, Everyone, published in 2007, my first trade book. <laughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and the book consisted of very short chapters. And the first 10 chapters, which as I recall, the first 68 pages, laid out this evolutionary toolkit, ending with a chapter titled Your Apprentice License. It's like you're a plumber or a carpenter, and now you have a toolkit. And the rest of the book was provided example after example, some for non-humans, some for humans, are seamlessly mixing the two and showing how this toolkit could be applied again and again and again. And the program did that in a larger sense. We offered a multi-course curriculum and a campus-wide seminar series, just like this one. Every week, a different talk, um, often on very different topics from the same evolutionary perspective. So this series right here is a replication of what I started in Binghamton. And I also started, uh, had an undergraduate seminar course around it. So what the, sem what the students did week in and week out was that they read something in preparation for the seminar. They wrote something, reflecting upon it is very important, attended the seminar, and then an extended Q&A after the seminar. And I have very prideful memories of like, imagine a typical university seminar, departmental seminar is given to a very small audience of faculty and graduate students. In our case, we had faculty and graduate students, and then as many as 90 undergraduate students, all prepared, and asking sharp questions to the speakers who were amazed, how did this happen that they had so many people attending and asking such literate questions? And it was thanks to this uh, to this uh, uh, education. And and many Evo students on their report on their comments would say, "This has been the best intellectual experience that I've had at college." We had NSF funding, and that led to a a small consortium of sister programs, especially one in New Paltz, headed by Glenn Gare, and one in the University of Alabama, of all places, headed by Chris Lynn. Um, so that's good, but not good enough. And I think when we get to pro-social world, we'll see what we're trying to do, I think, is just just like this, except really worldwide and and global, and including universities, but not restricted to universities. I think that's very, very um, important. Uh, we did good scholarship around this, so we did good pedagogical research, and uh, we can we can uh, direct you to these papers. Here we have a graph which shows how the course changed your views on evolution. It could be negative or positive, so in the middle is no change, and you can see that the responses are just stacked up in the positive end. And so, and that's reflected in the actual comments that uh, we would get from students. Um, uh, this course provides evidence that evolution is evident in everything. It revolutionized my way of viewing problems. EVOS provides a stimulating atmosphere within which biologists, anthropologists, philosophers, social scientists, and even those in the arts can transcend traditional academic boundaries and collaborate in addressing mutually interesting questions. It creates a think tank atmosphere of sorts, and it's a beautiful thing. And of course, that's exactly what we're trying to create with the pro-social commons and pro-social world as a uh, whole, whole. Absolutely free admission to anyone who wants to take, uh, take part. Um, so I mean, here's just a sample of the alumni of this, uh, of this uh, program. Uh, our guru Madhaven is the board chair of Pro Social World, so he's still very much with us and is also very high up in the National Academy of Engineering. And so he was an engineering student at Binghamton University and just by happenstance started to take, uh, you know, learn about EVOS. And he will tell you that it was basically life changing as far as his career was, um, um, was, uh, was concerned. Uh, here's another one, Deborah Lieberman, one of the very first EVOS uh, students. Now she's a professor in psychology. She does wonderful work on incest avoidance and disgust from an evolutionary perspective and how this is reflected in the in the um, in the law. So she's uh, that's still a very understudied area is law from an evolutionary perspective. And I vividly remember Deborah 
uh, coming into my office as a as a junior undergraduate junior, and just expressing her her outrage that the her other professors just didn't get it. They just didn't get it. She would say, and so uh, this was coming from a uh, undergraduate student. Here's Jonathan Gottschall, who is a best-selling author, the uh, storytelling animal, and his more recent book, The Storytelling Paradox. He was a graduate student in the English department at Binghamton University, and he wanted to study Homer from an evolutionary perspective. And this was such anathema to his professors and fellow graduate students in the English department that John had to assemble a committee of people uh, whose members were entirely outside his department. That's how that's how bad it it was. And then he went on to do great works, including this wonderful, wonderful book, which I think many of you know about and everybody should read. It's a very entertaining uh, every, uh, book. Justin Garcia um, I got involved with Evos as a freshman right at the beginning and never looked back. I think he had something like 15 publications by the time he finished graduate school. He stayed in Binghamton to um, to attend graduate school, and now he's executive director of the famous Kinsey Institute at Indiana University for sex, uh, sex uh, research. And his book is The Intimate Animal, How Why We've Evolved to Live and Die for Love. Uh, Dan O'Brien was my graduate student who, uh, who uh, came to work with me and started the Binghamton Neighborhood Project with me, which I'm about to relate. And when he came, he said, I, I might like to study forests. And, and I said, well, Dan, let's do something different. Let's study cities, can we? And then we, um, so we started the Binghamton Neighborhood Project. And then he went on to first to Harvard and then to Northeastern University. And then now he directs something called the Boston Area Research Initiative, which is just amazing. He actually succeeded to do in Boston, which we began, but ultimately largely failed to do in Binghamton. And I'm very happy to acknowledge the fact that what we did in Binghamton um, didn't really take root and to and to discuss why that might be, because that's an experience that many of us have uh, many of us had had. And so uh, here's uh, three current pro-social staff members. That um, that came from Binghamton, uh, Ian McDonald. The only picture I can have from him is in his wedding suit. So uh, uh, Sage Gibbons, who and then uh, Juliet Budiger, who's right, uh, who is uh, right here. And so it's an awesome, awesome younger generation of people that are now part of this uh, uh, this organization. So the Binghamton Neighborhood Project was a natural outgrowth of uh, Evos. Now that we were studying anything and everything from an evolutionary perspective on campus. Let's use our city as a field site, I said, because I'm a field biologist. This is what I do. But it turned out that that was a new model for human-related work in the in the field. And it was actually quite, uh, um, quite um, uh, distinctive. And one of the things we did, one of the first things is working with the school system and, and basically giving a survey to um, all of the students in the school system, uh, we were able to geotag that to their residential location and create these maps of prosociality. So the surveys measured how prosocial an individual is, and the maps showed basically how they clustered in the city. And so what we find, the dark regions are are islands of prosociality, or you might say mountain peaks of prosociality, and the light regions are valleys of prosociality and on a scale that for an individual varied from one to a hundred, the neighborhoods could vary from as many as 50 points. And the reason that I love this map and so many people are mesmerized by it is that if you're a biologist, this looks like the distribution map of a species. So let's pretend that it is the distribution map of a species. Let's say a plant species, which is dense in some regions and sparse in others. And you wanted to increase the abundance, the distribution and abundance of this species, what would you do? Well, you'd look at the underlying growth factors, wouldn't you? Um, the species is not present probably because of hostile growth conditions. And so since this is a map, not of a species, but of a human social strategy, we can ask the same question. If the reason it's here and not there is because of some underlying growth conditions and that if we can provide them, we can turn this whole city dark, basically. That should be 
that should be possible if we if we think of prosociality as a as a social strategy that either succeeds or fails depending upon Darwinian uh, Darwinian forces. And here's an example of how um, we began to use this in a practical sense. This is a section of the city, and the elementary school is in yellow there, the Horace Mann School. And the principal came to us and said, 90% of the problems in my school is caused by like 35 students. And we said, really? What are their addresses? And so he gave us their addresses, and then we mapped them onto the, the previous map. Here the coloration is reversed, or dark is, is a valley of prosociality. And every one of those pro problematic kids fell into a prosocial valley in the uh, cities. And so this shows you that we need to be holistic and whole system. If we want to solve problems in schools, then we ultimately we need to solve problems in in uh, neighborhoods and families and the whole the whole uh, uh, system. And so we worked um, in the school system and uh, the study we did on the Regents Academy, a school for at-risk uh, 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 students is well known to people and uh, still um, highly cited and discussed in, in um, pro-social uh, world. We also worked in the neighborhoods, uh, design your own park competition to turn neglected spaces into uh, into uh, a beautiful neighborhood parks. This is one of them on the north side. Um, and uh, and then uh, also we were funded by John, the John Templeton Foundation, which currently funds uh, Pro Social World, to study religion and spirituality in the context of everyday life. And I pulled up this slide from a presentation ten years ago when we were doing this project. Already, I'm talking about the field site approach, and I'm pointing out that religious and spiritual beliefs are diverse. 100 congregations in this little city of Binghamton, 200 in the county. Historically, they come and go, wax and wane, change during their existence. This is a bushy tree of cultural evolution. So what accounts for this incredible diversity, not to speak of diversity of people who do not participate in formal religion. So I'm thinking about a cultural ecosystem um, like an ecologist. And uh, through this project, I uh, came into contact with two people that are very important to me today in the pro-social world, Michelle Gelfand, who's on the uh, board of directors and is uh, famous for her work on tight and loose cultures, and Kurt Johnson, my great friend, who's, uh, who's uh, such a great particip uh, participator, par participator <laughs> in, uh, participant in, uh, in pro-social world and has such a vibrant um, life with the um, inner spiritual community and the evolutionary uh, evolutionary uh, leaders. So the lessons from the Binghamton Neighborhood Project are, it works. This toolkit, which should work in theory, actually uh, uh, did work. So of course, that was very gratifying. Also, the projects were hard work, hard work especially for me, who is not used to this. I wasn't brought up to do this kind of thing. And so uh, I was out of my comfort zone a lot of the, uh, a lot of the time. And number third, vulnerable to, to disruption by forces beyond our control, even when they worked. And in the case of the Regents Academy, the school that worked so beautifully, even starting the first year, and we had the numbers to prove it because we did a randomized control trial, Still, it was terminated by a new school superintendent whose idea of leadership was she had to just show up and and you know do things her way and so on and and um, and so forth. And so this is uh, actually in in um, Eleanor Ostrom terms, this is uh, a violation of core design principles seven and eight, basically concerning intergroup relationships. And so hard to see how to scale this up. Hard to see how to uh, uh, scale this up. And so it's against that background that the opportunity to create a think tank with my friend and co-founder Jerry Lieberman here presented itself. He actually contacted me because he read Evolution for Everyone and said he wanted to found a think tank, science-based think tank. Was I interested? And was probably surprised when I jumped in with both feet. So for me, I saw this as an opportunity to do worldwide what I was trying to do in Binghamton. And right away, we started to hold workshops then on different topics from an evolutionary perspective, starting with early childhood education. It's there that I met Peter Gray, 
and Peter Gray gave the first seminar in the fall seminar series that's recorded. And I think everyone should listen to Peter Gray on the anxiety epidemic in, in children. Um, we worked with Bruce Ellis on risky adolescent behavior and ethics, where we met Julie Seaman, who's one of our big supporters, and um, a law professor, another person studying law from an evolutionary uh, perspective. We studied the quality of life, which led us to work in Norway. That's still very much a strong relationship to think of Norway as a case study of cultural evolution at the national scale. I met Lynn Ostrom. So my work with Lynn Ostrom was done through this, um, uh, several workshops on economics. And then uh, we were responsible with Michelle Gelfand, and this is where Joe Brewer came into the picture with forming the Cultural Evolution Society. So this was amazingly uh, uh, generative to do this. And part of this was this view of life magazine at the very early days of the Evolution Institute. One of my students at Binghamton was named Robert Kadar. He was a history student. And then he uh, was getting his master's in uh, anthropology and he has an entrepreneurial streak. So uh, he came with me to the Evolution Institute and he said, let's start an online magazine. And for me, this was an opportunity to basically do an online realization of the EVOS concept. And now this view of life which is managed and has been for a long time by Eric Michael Johnson, who I think is on this call, if I'm not mistaken. Quite a few of the people I'm talking about are, are here. And uh, quickly enough, I'll end my presentation and they can speak about these different facets of pro-social world. Um, so, and, and, then, um, and then Robert went on to uh, found a second online magazine, evenomics.com, which has become very influential <laughs> in uh, the next evolution of uh, economic, uh, uh, thinking and this experience actually enabled him to have a career in uh, in marketing, online marketing. Uh, that's been spectacular. Uh, now he's working for Yeshiva University in New York for their graduate program, but before that he was the main marketer for the entire CUNY system of New York. If you can imagine, uh, if you can imagine uh, that. Okay, so now I think you can see the pieces of pro-social world coming together. Uh, in 2008, I met and started working with Tony Biglund and Steve Hayes and Dennis Embry. I attended my first ACBS conference in 2009. And ever since plenary speakers, they've, they've made sure that at least one plenary speaker was an evolutionary scientist. And so that society has been basically evolutionizing for uh, 14 years. Uh, I met, uh, of course, in uh, 2009, I met uh, Eleanor and her associate, Michael Cox. Michael gave a seminar in the fall semester, so you could see his seminar on the website. We began to produce special issues and and uh, target articles, such as uh, evolution as a general theoretical framework for economics and public policy, evolving the future towards the science of intentional change, and then books. Uh, one edited book with Steve Hayes and then ProSocial with Paul and and Steve. Uh, up at top here, the very first thing we did was just a PDF that was a training and assessment manual. This was 2014. It was so humble, but it was good enough for some of the people that are actually on this call. I noticed, Stu, you're here, uh, that uh, basically this is where they entered it. And then because they're so gifted and um, and um, already have uh, practices and so on. They took it on and did amazing um, uh, things with this. So these were the early adopters. And I have Lori here, Lori Weiser, who's a business consultant and who became involved and was really instrumental in uh, helping, uh, helping us get off the ground. She just left the board of directors, but of course she's still with us and works closely with Tony, uh, Tony um, uh, Big Biglin. So, um, so my two main projects within the Evolution Institute, this view of life and pro-social, uh, eventually grew to the point of needing to become their own organization. Paul was now with us. He was wanted to devote full time to this. Uh, Jeff Janung had his own nonprofit organization and website, contemplativelife.org. And initially, he just wanted to feature pro-social on his own website. But the more he learned about it, the more he decided that Social was the best use of his time and talents, and he had the experience to form a nonprofit. Uh, we would not exist without Jeff, and and uh, 
And so uh, thanks to all of these people, um, we became an um, independent nonprofit in 2020. Eric moved over to continue managing TVOL and Ashley Bailey Gilgreath, who I think is on this call, I noticed Ashley, who was the operations manager for Evolution Institute, moved over in uh, just about um, um, a year ago. So the staff of ProSocial World reflects this history that I am recounting. Okay, so now I'm doing pretty well with time. I'm going to finish up in about five minutes, I think. So what are the lessons from the last 50 years? Uh, number one, an evolutionary worldview is transformative for how we think and therefore how we uh, act. This worldview change proven itself in the biological sciences, now proving itself for everything associated with the words human culture and policy. But these developments are extraordinarily recent. When you take that maturation factor into account, then you can see that many of the books that I cited were, were published three, five, 10 years ago. Um, and of course, they continue to change uh, uh, rapidly. And so naturally, most people on earth do not know anything about this. And so ProSocial World is one of only, uh, the only organizations maybe the only, along with the Evolution Institute, that truly gets this and attempts to catalyze it worldwide and has the ambition to catalyze it worldwide. So this is what differentiates us from almost every other organization with a pro-social um, mission. This requires a diverse portfolio of activities. We must have a basic scientific research program, and there must be practical applications that take place in parallel, not sequentially. Not the case that first we do basic science and then maybe apply it down the road. So um, uh, so these need to take place in the field, in parallel. Uh, we need to communicate along what we call the science to narrative chain, everything to a multitude of audience, including mass audiences and also um, um, uh, communication that provides more intellectual depth as this view of life uh, does. Uh, this is this toolkit is relevant to all contexts and scales. And so we have these topic areas here, which are the ones we're currently focusing on, macro, whole earth, ethic, micro, the importance of small groups, and meso, everything in between. And this graphic here of polycentric governance, which is another idea attributed to the Ostroms, um, just conveys this multi-level polycentric uh, framework that we need to uh, that we need to uh, uh, create and that maps on to generalize uh, multi-level cultural evolution. So here we are uh, heading into our third year. We have 14 full-time and four part-time staff members. You can read it here, a large annual budget numerous grant-funded projects, including this major grant from the John Templeton Foundation, which has just been a huge uh, boost to uh, us. Uh, scientific research, communication strategy, our facilitation program has trained over 800 facilitators from 35 nations, an expanding ecosystem of partner organizations and social networks. Amazing, heading into our third, uh, third year. So I'm so grateful to everyone that's been involved in making this this uh, uh, this happen. We take our own governance very seriously. Jeff likes to say that we need to eat our own dog food. In other words, apply our own principles. And so we see our own organization as one which consists of many subgroups that have to be related to each other in a certain way. Uh, we we're, uh, we're admire uh, sociocracy, so we get a lot of ideas from sociocracy. And more, gen more generally, we don't think that we're the only ones with the answer. We know that good practices have evolved again and again and again as a form of, of uh, convergent cultural evolution. And so we're always on the lookout for good practices and to adopt them and to generalize them and to, and to assist them basically so that we could work collaboratively at the ecosystem, uh, ecosystem um, level. So we take our own governance uh, very seriously indeed. Uh, at last, we have a new website, which I've just been waiting for, and we're generally a digital infrastructure. Uh, we work with the open source um, um, 
uh, platform, Hilo Social Coordination for a Thriving uh, Planet. We have a wonderful relationship with them working directly with the uh, developers. So if you're a group, then you can have a Hilo site free of charge, just the press of a button, and you can have a digital home um, that um, to uh, work with and with whom to interact with other uh, other groups. And I have many people to thank for all of this, but especially Sage Gibbons for leading the effort with the IT and the website development, him plus many, uh, many others. Um, we have uh, our facilitator training is, uh, is uh, always evolving. And here's, uh, again, a screenshot of the new website, which shows you how pretty it is. And the leading pro-social course, the next offering, um, starts February 21. And uh, so you could go to that website um, and uh, and we'll provide links so you can just uh, ask us and you could embark on uh, um, uh, this this training. That's the very best. If you're serious and if you really want to, to just get involved with our community like right away and you know that this is for you, then um, that's uh, I can't recommend that uh, highly, uh, highly enough. Um, our scientific research program is starting up. I was hoping that this article here titled multi-level cultural evolution from new theory to practical applications would have been accepted by now. And I'm pretty sure it will be, not 100%. Um, it's uh, uh, submitted to the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences and does a great job of um, outlining the general par paradigm and its application to these uh, these areas. And the author authors I've introduced, um, you, some of their names, but it, it would be hard to find a more distinguished group of uh, authors. Michelle Rita Caldwell is a former head of the National Science Foundation and still a very active microbial ecologist. Michelle Gelfand, I've mentioned, she's also a member of the National Academy. Steve Hayes, of course, is a giant. Paul is amazing. And so uh, what are, what, what's, what caliber, basically, that, uh, and then to publish something like this in, in one of the premier journals really gives us what I often call capturing the intellectual high ground in terms of basic scientific uh, research. And then we have lots of other stuff taking place. I want to wrap this up, so I won't go through it in too, in too much detail. But one of the things we're doing is, is creating an advisory board, not of individuals, but of organizations. And this is another example of multi-level thinking. Here we have five different types of societies, ACBS, which is already involved, the main society for Ostrom style governance, the Cultural Evolution Society, which is the main society for academic cultural evolution studies, and then a number of participatory action organizations, all providing teams to work with each other um, and then report back to their organization. So that's a, a multi-level multi advisory structure rather than just having a group of individuals, which would be the typical way of doing things. And this year we'll be starting numerous workshops and we've structured the workshops to, in the first place, result in content early, accessible content early, published on this view of life, and then leading to the workshop and the, and the uh, academic content and the research programs following that. And I think of what we aspire to be as roughly comparable, not in detail, but to the Santa Fe Institute, which is well known and deservedly so as a hub for um, a complex system science research. And I see pro-social world as becoming that kind of a hub for evolutionary science and to be very complementary with complex systems uh, science. And so there's our current topic areas and just a brief listing of, of field sites, which are all over the world. A shout out to the project in Latin America, uh, which is just an awesome project funded by the Templeton World Charity Foundation, a second Templeton Foundation, but amazing work going on, which will be featured. There'll be case studies featured on the new, uh, on the new uh, uh, website. Uh, the Pro-Social Commons started up as less than a year old. It will be celebrating its first birthday on Darwin's birthday, February 12th. And we're going to have an online celebration for Pro-Social World as a whole. And this is a community where anyone can join to learn and act upon this view of life, no matter what your current starting point. So you might be a professor. You might be a high school student. You might even be a prison inmate like Gary Shepard 
who is a very important member of our community, a former prison um, uh, inmate. So this is a big sandbox for people to learn and to act and to form groups, self-generated groups, and to learn the principles um, uh, that way. So it's an amazingly vibrant um, uh, group that's, um, uh, I think it has vast growth potential. I can see it growing into the uh, thousands and tens of thousands, frankly. So future of pro-social, I love this gift here. This is uh, an example of chemical catalysis. Uh, look it up, it's called elephant toothpaste. And um, chemical catalysis, I'm fascinated with the concept of it. It's a substance that you could add in a tiny amount and in increases the rate of a chemical reaction by orders of magnitude. And so the question is, can rates of cultural evolution be catalyzed as well? I think it can. And so this means that what we must see is within the realm of possibility is that we can accomplish in years what otherwise might require decades or not take place at all. And an example of that is why I'm in England, this event on January 30th, titled A New Economic Paradigm for People and the Planet. There will be a conversation between myself, my colleague, my economist colleague, Dennis Snower, and the chief executive of the this organization, the Royal Society of Arts, um, Andy Haldane, who was the former chief economist for the Bank of England. And so this is a very impressive organization with over 20,000 fellows. Um, the, uh, it's an it's an in-person event, and their largest hall is filled with 250 people, over 750 registered online um, internationally. So this is, I think, a hint that basically this is catching on and a tremendous curiosity is developing for this. And our objective here is to provide what we call enlightened top-down support, not heavy-handed top-down support, not done to, but done with. Here we have equity and diversity and all these things that not only need to be honored, but are just baked in to the core design principles. So we want to catalyze bottom-up efforts, such as in England, um, uh, Richard Coates' effort in uh, his uh, little village, and then in Bristol, uh, Duncan Gillard and Freddie Jackson Brown's effort in the school system of, of Bristol. Start these up bottom-up and then provide top-down um, support is what we're aiming to uh, to do. <laughs> okay, so this is my last slide. Just pointing out the entry points. If you want to become involved in pro-social world, everyone should join the pro-social commons. Uh, pro-social commons was an experiment, and it's worked well enough. So we just think that it should maybe the whole organ the whole organization should be should be the pro-social uh, commons, and then and then um, of course there's the other. Uh, circles. Uh, facilitator training, we're all set up for that. Field site development, if you're a group that wants to use this, and especially a place-based group, but any group really, a school, a business, then um, then uh, please see us. So we have uh, Dunya Saim as, a, as our uh, community development catalyst. Uh, scientific research, I think we want to really be a hub for other research, and so uh, so definitely get in touch with us for scientific research. We're actually starting a um, a research seminar series, which will also be taking place every week, um, and will uh, enable us to really geek out on the um, on the uh, uh, science. And then uh, we're always on the lookout, of course, for people that uh, and organizations that could provide this enlightened top-down support uh, with multiple forms of capital, not just money. Uh, there's many forms of capital. And uh, and uh, it's very important not to not to have to translate everything into uh, into monetary uh, monetary terms. Well, there you are again, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I'm done, and I'm uh, eager for uh, uh, questions. And uh, with the way we do things is to uh, raise your virtual hands, please, and that cues you up. And then uh, we can, uh, and that we can uh, uh, have a great conversation. And and so many people from pro social world are here, so that they can now speak for themselves and provide a little more depth to my thirty thousand foot view. So I see Peter Bullock from from uh, pro social schools and youth, and Kate Sheehan from pro social uh, spirituality. Uh, quite a few from the pro social commons, like Brian 
uh, McConnell. I see Stu Libman, who has been with ProSocial a long time and is doing amazing work in uh, Pittsburgh. I was there earlier this month. Dunia is our community development uh, catalyst. David Curry has been working with me in Binghamton for a long time. Uh, and so uh, lots of people are prepared to prepared to speak. Um, and so that'll be uh, that'll be great. And so, Brian, I'm not surprised that there, you, you're the first with your hand up. Oh, Eric is here, too, by the way. So I uh, wanted just to mention mention him. That's that's because my normal state is closer to confusion than others. Um, <laughs> so puts puts me at the head from I'm the dispensable one at the head of the pack, you know. Um <laughs> I'm and I'm a little off topic, David, but um I would really be interested in your response. Um to this question, but on your own terms. So you can deal, feel free, please, to deal. You don't have to deal with it publicly if you choose another uh, route. Um, but I I was really intrigued by Stephen Hayes' uh, presentation uh, last, last Friday. Um, and I, I, some of my closer kind of pro-social uh, friends, I have been, we've been chatting between us very informally. I've kind of been ex, uh, expressing, sharing uh, how how intrigued and interested I was with Stephen's con content and <clears throat> prospects of exploring it uh, more, more deeply. Uh, as I started to do that, just kind of on a personal um you know, I, I kind of have my approach to inquiry and research and all, all of that. I was like immediately overwhelmed by science speak, uh, basically uh, <laughs> in, in, encoded epistemology yeah. um, that was, I, I mean, that was kind of, it was an initial wall to some extent um, to an approach that you know, I I tend to be kind of more dialogic, that uh, a, a collective context informing, you know, uh, with respect to content is is helpful for for me, kind of in my learning process. So, but but a little more specifically, Stephen had in introducing his presentation had, although he acknowledged you as his mentor, he also conveyed um, not knowing how the content that he was about to present was might land with with, with you. And as you know, it sounded as though he were. Um, I, I I really appreciate kind of that that academic uh, op openness. But so whatever response you might. Yeah, so I think you've raised several things, Brian. One is that the these seminar speakers are chosen not to be one-off events, but to actually lead to something. And that something might be a discussion, a dialogue, but hopefully will lead to um, action. And the pro-social commons is the perfect venue for that. If people were really interested, intrigued by by Steve's talk as well they should be, then there should be discussion group organized. And, uh, and we really need to be to get in the habit of what we call sprint groups. So whenever we want to do something, we'll do it. It might be a book club, we'll read a book, we're setting up a whole book club. It might be a discussion of papers. There's anything we want to do, we can do. Um, and if we're in practice with the design principles and so on, then we can get these groups to function pretty well just because we've internalized our tools of the matrix and the, um, and the core design principles. And in the case of Steve, the opportunities for that are exceptionally good because we're all ready to, to want to develop research around Steve's Steve's I, ideas. Um, and uh, one of the things he said is that because each individual is its own dynamic system, then the only way you can study this is by to gather lots of data on each individual. You just can't gather a single data point on on individuals and take averages and things and things like that. No. And he's developing an app so that if you want to participate in this. It's called the experience sampling method. You get signaled again and again and again 
um, and then you respond. And now we develop uh, um, uh, a, a data set for each and every individual, and then we aggregate from 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 there. So we can be doing that. But it's up to us. We could we could just say, yeah, happy to be guinea pigs um, for this. So that's one point that you that you made. Another point you made is how opaque this can easily get. And that you know when the when the experts talk to each other, and I mean it it goes over my head, uh, lots of the uh, lots of the time. Then it's incumbent that we we if if you can't make it intelligible, then you don't understand it yourself. And very often the advice is, and the advice is given. It's the advice I give. Write it so that your mother will understand it, or that the person in the bar will uh, understand it. And if you can't, then you don't really understand it yourself. And so that's where the communication parts of this uh, parts of this come in. And so I would love for this to result in when the way we should do this, Brian, if this is working as it should, is put out a call, write a little proposal, put it on the Hilo website, see who's interested, and get going. And it might be three, five, ten, twenty. Uh, but it'll be better as a group than as an as an individual, and and as a group that makes a few commitments, so that they uh, they follow through, as you well know. So so let me pass on to uh, Chris. How are you from Minnesota? Hi, David. Thank you. Um, I I uh, just watching your presentation. Uh, I'm just so very impressed with a, a number of uh, practical applications, which I was somewhat aware of, but it's great to see so many of them. Um, we're, I work in both academic and community contexts, and in both of those, uh, and, you know, nationally, internationally, uh, questions around race, racism, diversity, equity, inclusion are, are, are really paramount. And I'm just wondering if... Uh, if you can point me to any resources where the you know this peaks and valleys approach or um, best practices that kind of thing where pro social has been applied because what I'm seeing when I when I look for uh, best practices with um, with uh, that are backed up by data or research is that there's really nothing there. <laughs> Maybe I can pass this to. Uh, um... Peter, would you like to to uh, take field field this question? I, I'm happy to, but it would be nice to bring in yeah, some other people. And you know maybe what? Eric it might or... be it might be fun to if you created breakout rooms, maybe Julia, and we can move ourselves, and so Chris and I could go into that breakout room and chat, and uh, and then the group could continue to chat, and anyone who wants can join Chris and I. I'm happy to do that. Uh, would that a good idea that uh, we get everyone can begin talking basically if we go into small. Yeah, then oh, we uh, then we avoid the ping pong game and we can actually just get if we were in real world, right? We'd be like, come over here to the, you know, to the side of the lobby. Let's chat. Yeah, yeah. So uh let's do that. Let's uh let's um uh, uh Juliet, can you do that on the fly? Sure. Do we all want to do small groups or start with just Peter and Chris? If you just, open just up I, I don't know how easily it could be done, whether we want to make it random or give choice. Of, um, I don't want to make, spend too much time on the logistics. Yeah, here's what I was thinking, Julia. Nobody has to go anywhere. They can just stay here in the main session with David. But if you open room one, two, three, four, and give us the ability to move there if we want, then Chris and I can go to room one, whoever wants to join us can. If something else comes up, another side conversation, you can say, oh, well, why don't you go in room two? Or people stay in the main session with David. That's what, what sure. I was thinking. So I'm going to okay, start well. off with um, Chris and Peter in room two, and everyone should have the option to move. And then I have an extra third room if something else comes up. Okay. All right. So that's uh, that's uh, that's fine. Then uh, then I'm here for other questions. All right. So my interest was uh, similar. Uh, I'd like to get into room two. So how do I do that? I'll move you over right now. Thank you. And then if everyone wants, it'll just be we'll will be one big uh, one big uh, group again. Stu, are you there? Because it might be helpful for you to talk a little bit about how you encountered ProSocial uh, in its early days 
and where you've uh, where you've taken it. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. Yeah, we we've sort of been in it uh, pro-social from the inception because we've had to act and play. I serve as the medical director of a school-based partial hospital program for kids with autism, and we've had act and play since. Uh, uh, just, just around the time the first act book came out in 1999. So, so we've just sort of grown with pro-social from its inception to the point where we now have uh, woven it into the fabric of the way we operate. Um, but rather than belabor that, the, the latest is that to pick up David on what you were saying about Steve Hayes, we're waiting final IRB approval for a research project that's actually going to use the measures and the statistical analyses that he was talking about. Um, it, it's kind of complicated because it requires all the staff in our agency uh, responding twice daily because uh, the gimme, the statistical analysis he's talking about requires 60 data points, but we're actually folding that into a project that we're doing agency-wide. Um, and there are some pro-social measures in addition uh, that are built into that. So the latest turn, uh, David Forrest, is that we're actually trying to uh, kind of stay on the cutting edge and, and use what Steve's talking about um, as a, a way of piloting that kind of research. Yeah, yeah. And I wanted to, that uh, prompts me to, to observe that there's a kind of a Cadillac version of, of pro-social implementations that's very scientifically rigorous from the start. Um, and so that's great when that can take place. There's many other situations in which that is inappropriate and to attempt it would be um, harmful to the basically the interests of the group. At the opposite extreme, um, um, the, uh, the, the, the tools are applied, but, um, but there's little that you would recognize as scientific assessment. But nevertheless, we are developing tools to get information from that in a, very, in a, in a variety of ways, but I'm kind of having in mind somebody who's thinking, oh yeah, I mean, my churches could get interested in this or my neighborhood play group could get, could get interested in this and might be intimidated to think that that's gonna involve some big scientific research program. And first and foremost, this is what it means to be participatory is that we don't just impose the, the research program on you. We really, we find out what, what, what do you need and then we go from go from uh, there, and so I think that makes it quite friendly to to people that might otherwise be intimidated by the uh, the kind of sciency feel of things. Well, and to that point, a small group of us are working with, with that and with uh, relational frame theory. And what we're really trying to do, David, is to come up with some measures that are really accessible and that could be used in a sprint group or used across other groups as a way of, of bringing a, a degree of objective measurement. So while right now I think we're kind of on the cutting edge of esoterica, we're really looking to see how, how can we use this to develop some really easily accessible measures along the lines of what you're talking about. Yeah, and, and um, one of the things I'm gonna ask David Curry, if you would do, to speak on the, on the on the idea of local chapters, because uh, so many of these groups are online and I don't never bash the internet. When you think of like what's happening right now, there's, there's, there's so much that's, that's wonderful and necessary about online interactions. But if it could actually take place at, in your home, your hometown, your neighborhood, your family, your school, your business, then that's even better. And so to implement place-based chapters, is a priority. And I know that it's not easy from experience. So, uh, but I also think that the things could take a turn so that it actually does become easy. And that's because when there's enough of a framework is in place, people that are already trying, and Richard is, is um, actually, you should uh, speak alongside uh, David, Richard, as to what you're doing. I mean, people are so hungry for this in some sense. And if they're already doing it, often they are doing it pretty well. It's not as if everyone's failing at this kind of thing. There's often there's very strong efforts and and uh, and groups that are that are functioning well, but could do so even better with these principles. And so I would love to think that that um, 
2023, among other things, will be the year of the local chapter, the year of the place-based growth social uh, uh, groups. There'll be many of them starting up and they'll derive strength from each other because they know they're not the only one and that we could arrange for them to talk to each other and change ideas and even travel between communities and, and set up a real multi-level. So uh, David and, and Richard, if you don't mind me putting you on the spot um, and in either order, could you just talk about uh, local, uh, uh, what you're trying to do in, in, in your localities? Sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to do that, Richard. Um, thank you, mate. Ta, it's my turn now. Um, all right, so yeah, I grew up in London, Richard. So, um, so anyway, yeah, so I've been, I've been working in community for a while, digging into that. I put a lot of information in the chat about what I've done, what I'm doing now. And um, we're going to be launching uh, the, we're going to be launching an opportunity to form circles in Binghamton, the, the sort of ancient practice of circle, but circles that create their own shared wisdom as to how to make the community better for the good of all. And uh, that shared wisdom then gets shared outwardly into the community um, and begins the conversation about how do we change actual policies and how do we begin to practice self-rule. And as that occurs, we're also in the practice of circle practicing how to become more interconnected with each other. I refer to this as oneness. And so if, as we, uh, I believe this is taking place in an evolutionary transition. Um, and so there's an imperative to move as quickly as we can and replicate. And so I created a four step strategy that includes a heavy dose of pro-social uh, because there is no self-rule without pro-social and governing the commons, right? So, so, and then how do we take it to the next step? And then, so that's where I'm working on two levels at the level of the leadership globally in these large groups to say, listen, can we cohere at least in terms of strategy um, and, and, a, and create a hive of hives where we're interconnecting and sharing our information, our wisdom, so that we can quickly adapt across the globe. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, we'll actually be seeing each other. And Joe Brewer is coming to town. Um, and it's going to be like a Johnny Appleseed, basically, for sowing this kind of um, uh, this kind of uh, thing. Uh, Richard, and then, uh, and then Susan, uh, um, to say a little bit about the Charter for Compassion project, which is an amazing project and, and really illustrates this multi-level thing communities within a larger framework. But Richard, please uh, please tell what I'm about to experience in two days. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a neuropsychologist by background, so used to working with brain injury usually, but um, yeah, really um, yeah, moved and um, really impacted by what's happening to the planet. I wanted to do something locally uh, with my community and, and moved into a new area, didn't know anyone. We'd had Brexit, everyone very much divided. And um, yeah, I, having discovered ACT and that psychological flexibility just to be able to move towards something that really matters to you, your values, even though your mind is saying, this isn't gonna work out, no one's gonna be interested. And finding pro-social and being inspired by that, um, I just decided just to give it a go to experiment in my local community who else wanted to come together to, uh, to start a sustainability group and one specifically for our community. There was one down the road that they were happy for us to join with, but I knew from local context, we needed something in our own village. And that's when we set up Pearly Sustainability Group near Reading in the UK. And that was 2020, just before COVID hits and not a great time to start a group. Um, but we adapted. Um, we had a core group of people who came together, 10 people. 
And then we diversified within that group. I was particularly attuned to what really mattered to each individual within the group. So we had someone who was a keen cyclist and part of a local cycling campaign. So they became the lead for active transport, focusing on trying to get a, a cycleway between two close villages. Uh, we had someone else particularly passionate about gardening. So they became the lead for trying to set up a community orchard and, um, and someone who was really passionate about repairing things rather than throwing things away. So they became the lead. Um, for a repair cafe that we have once a month now that um, people come along to a local cafe bring stuff and it gets repaired and so I was yeah this this organism started to take shape with this differentiation and um, yeah and that core design principle one that shared, cleared shared purpose um, and identity and there were some differences in that, and I've tried to make room for that. So some people are really passionate about the environment and the planet. And for some, it's more about community well-being and developing community. And for some, it's both. So, so we cater to all of those, those needs. Um, we are um, autonomous, that core design principle seven. We make our own decisions. Uh, we're fair and inclusive in our decision making. Um, we work by consensus decision making, really, um, and also that core design principle eight, uh, we actively collaborate uh, with groups around us. Um, we've got to the stage where the local government, the parish council now sends a representative to all of our meetings. Um, and they recently nominated us for um, community awards with the district council and um, very pleased to say that we won a community group of the year um, for our efforts. So that's great to see that that's being recognized. And, and this is all inspired by ACT and, and pro-social. And at the moment it's implicit with people. So I kind of model the processes and we've developed our own ways of doing it, but people don't know yet, you know, the explicit side of pro-social. And, and that's going to change with David coming on on Sunday. And um, then I'm keen to see, you know, what else happens as we we make um, pro-social more explicit, if that's what people want to do. That's I mean, I'm I'm just lost in admiration, Victor. I can see that, that you're such a gifted uh, therapist. And that that article I mentioned, which has Steve Hayes as a um, co-author of the section on mental and health and well-being. He says something much like what you just said, Richard, is that is that um, the whole therapeutic relationship is one in which the therapist models this kind of sensitivity um, in their own behavior and then manages the for their client to internalize it so that they could take it back to their everyday um, uh, life. And you're doing so much without like being explicit about it. So you're not telling people about the core design principles. You're just using them and you're trying to create a social environment where they exist and you're being very contextual about it. And then at some point, sharing the information a little bit more explicitly is appropriate. But until then, I hear you saying, you really just want to appeal to their passions. And if it's bicycling or repair or or so on, and then if assign leadership roles, that is CDP2, basically, because you're spreading the workload and so on and so forth. So it's a, like a gifted form of niche construction, if you're familiar with that term, where you're constructing the social environment and you have the principles in mind. You're functioning in the capacity of the designer of the social system. And then that's a little bit different than being a participant in the system that's being designed and so that's my kind of rendition of of uh, of what i heard from uh, uh what i heard from you and it sounds so simple and it is i think once you set it up it actually does become almost spontaneous but only because you set it up that way so so um it's so amazing to think that if we get good at this then we'll just be able to replicate it replication Variation, selection, or replication. And the replication part, I think, in biology comes for free because organisms reproduce. We don't have to think much about it. They just do it. But to replicate a program, <laughs> is, uh, is we have to think a lot about it. So, so anyhow, Susan, uh, tell us about the Charter for Compassion and your role. And because this is a case where 
we have local efforts, but also we do have some enlightened top-down support. Mm, thank you. So nice to be here. Um, so my name is Susan Soleil, and I actually have the great honor of being a, a shared staff person between the Charter for Compassion and Pro Social World. And I once heard a, a scientist, a professor, say that there are the hard sciences, the sciences, and then, or the hard, yeah, and then the other sciences, not the softer, but they're the harder sciences and the <laughs> social sciences. And and I love that pro social is actually combining both the harder and the harder, the hard and the harder sciences. Um, and so, as a staff person that's kind of shared by both organizations, I am bringing the incredible network of the Charter for Compassion, which is compassionate cities and partners and sectors, and bringing all of that as best I can as a bridge into pro-social world. And I'm bringing all of the tools and the science and the research and the data from, and the CDPs from pro-social world and trying to bring that over into the Charter for Compassion. And so it feels, I think, um, I often hear Jeff say, we're not two organizations, but maybe one organism. And so we're working toward that. And um, thank you for giving me a few minutes. That's so great. And the idea of working through this, uh, through social network, working through existing social networks is a very important principle, already well known. If you know about technological innovation, if you know that literature, then working through existing social networks, of course, makes sense. Charter for Compassion is one. Another is um, Kate Rareworth's Donut Economics. And I actually had dinner with Kate and her husband, Roman, uh, who's the author of The um, the Good Ancestor, a book that you might, that you might um, know. And so there's another network. There's also the Conscious Capitalism Network, um, which was uh, co-founded by Raj uh, Sisodia. Uh, there's the Deep Transformation Network, which um, which uh, was founded by Jeremy Lent. There's Earth Regenerators, founded by Joe Brewer. And in all of these cases, we have communities that are uh, very aligned in terms of what they're what they're driving towards. Uh, uh, although there might be differences in how they do it, but to actually create cooperation at that level, at that level, and to break down the archipelago. Um, and to have communication across networks that's, that's also collaborative is something that we're um, doing very actively uh, this um, uh, this year. Back to the pro-social commons, what's about to take place, just this takes one minute because it shows you the knitting together. So in our new seminar series, we featured Jeremy Lent, his wonderful work on the pattern instinct. And he has his community that he's built up, the Deep Transformation Network. So that was widely attended, his, his lecture. Next thing that happened was that he organized a conversation between the two of us on his network, Deep Transformation Network. So there was a meeting of the minds that way. Third thing that's gonna happen, and this is what's about to happen, is let's field a team from each of our communities and have them interact for a period of time to explore common ground and collaborative uh, uh, potential. Who wants to play? And while we're at it, since Jeremy Lent's community was inspired by Joe Brewer's Earth Regenerators, let's bring in Earth Regenerators and have them field a team. And so they can have just a great time discussing what they do, how they can help each other, nuts and bolts things like, you know, Mighty Networks as a platform compared to Hilo as a, as a platform. And what are we going to do with this at this level? And so we're setting that up, and that's going to be done through the Pro Social Commons. Um, and it's just the kind of thing of this uh, playful innovation that we are in a position to uh, uh, to do if we can be uh, 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 coordinated. So we're all wrapping up here, by the way, but Brian, please. I had just posted a question to you, kind of directed your way um, Regarding your mention of replication with regard to biological systems, uh, and I'm just wondering <clears throat> about your take on the viability of adopting uh, regenerative um, design principles, um, kind of what, what I'm, just to bounce that off of you, I guess. Well, I feel the concept of regenerative design is being pursued 
by multiple people and organizations. And it's another good example of how we need to avoid the almost inevitable, unless you do something about it, fragmentation of how people go about it. And that there's a, a, a quite a good, I think, analogy with open source software development, such as Linux, where you get a big community of people working on code. It has to remain internally consistent. And if you don't, you get forking, which sometimes forking is good, but usually it's bad. And, and you really have to take measures that when somebody creates a new bit of code and then they contribute it to the whole system, that that code is, is, um, is compatible. And so there's a, a, a very uh, extensive quality control system that that um, that gets established. And I would think that that's probably almost certainly not the case for for the concept of regenerative design. And in the absence of that, you're going to get forking, and you're going to get very many different versions. And we're all going to have to struggle to understand the correlation between them and all of all of that. And so the more we can get organized and we can think about regenerative design together then we can avoid that and we can uh, also understand it as a uh, um, as the need for uh, the need for replication and replication is you know pretty deep cultural replication in the broad sense funnels through child development and name me an economic initiative that actually thinks about child development in any way at all but the fact is that the cultures are replicated through children and they're born into the system and somehow they acquire it. And that's only because of a scaffolding that's around it. And this has to be included in policy analysis. Who's thought that way before? And so that's how holistic it becomes. And, and, uh, and what we're in a position to catalyze basically, it is trending. You know, I have to say, I have no doubt about the direction of this. But I do have doubts about the speed of it and then what might happen by way of collapse and other things that just destroys everything. And so for me, that gives a kind of an urgency that uh, not only do we need to move things along, but we need to do it fast. And and um, and uh, uh, time is not going to wait. So we really want we want this to happen in years, please, not decades, not decades. And I think it can. So that's my final word and let's just check out those of us that are still here um uh gary so nice to see you here and i'm sorry that uh, we didn't actually uh, have you but say whatever you'd like right right now nice to see you <clears throat> right now i'm out with my mother i had to go shopping with her but i wanted to listen so i've just been listening to the whole thing even while i'm running around the uh supermarket and everything else <laughs> <laughs> um but uh I just think it's so great that uh, everything that we're working on is all coming together and integrating. Um, and it shows all the different uh, organizations and groups that are getting involved. And even though we, we saw a lot of these things eventually, you know, transforming, I mean, when you used to think about these things that uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago, I mean, I'm sure you're, you, you feel the same way. You saw that things needed to start to, go together and come together in the same fashion but it's just slow moving most people don't know about it like you said most people aren't aware that it exists in the world a lot of the science uh is is new and uh to me it's just exciting to see that people are starting to uh apply things in an evolutionary perspective and uh as a whole systems approach and uh so for me that's just great you know well, part of it, part of it uh, is to have the proper attitude towards failure, and and you know not to be afraid of failure. Failure is the leading edge of change, and so basically, if something didn't work, then just let's just acknowledge that real fast, try to understand why, and then iterate again and again and again. And that's hard to do. It's hard for me to do. I think it's hard for everyone to do. Um, is to have a constructive attitude towards failure. Maybe I could just um, end up here with the two people who haven't spoke yet, Juliet and Eric, if you're there. And uh, both of you are in the thick of the of the um, organization as it's um, as it's evolving. And love to have uh, uh, your thoughts briefly, um, and then we'll we'll uh, bring it to a close. Yeah, I mean, um, 
you know, I was thinking back to my early days at Binghamton, the lectures about the knowledge archipelago and silos between disciplines. And I think um, speaking to pro-social world as an organization, um, you can start to see in even our, our own little microcosm how different everyone's background is and expertise and really see how that's that's catalyzing us forward. So just reflecting on that and excited to see where it goes. Great. Eric, are you uh, are you there? Maybe he's maybe. on. He might not be in a position to turn yeah. his microphone on. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things in, in my own closing is that uh, when I think of the people that have said made personal decisions, yeah, this is the best way to spend my time. I mean, I this is this is the most positive thing I can do is I can get involved with building this this um, organization. And you get people like Jeff and Paul and and uh, so many. Um, and then Beth, who's not here, is a new research director. I think I can report it because she said it in a meeting. Um, she said, uh, "Never before have I been have I been tempted to use the word joy with respect to my workplace, but that there's something about working here which is joyful." And I think that's what a truly pro-social orientation does. We basically we can be as pro-social as we know how to be. And because of the environment that we built for ourselves, we will not be exploited. We will not be exploited. We live in such a safe environment that we can just be givers and we'll be fine for it. And so that is something which I think to have, and there's, don't get me wrong, there's lots that's not going well with our organization. I mean, so so it's not as if we figured it all out by, by any means, but I think we do have that basic orientation, which does lead to a, to a joyful um, social environment, at least uh, certainly for, for, um, for myself. So, and so my friends, I think with that, we have another one in the can, as they say, and in just a few days, we'll have this glorious website with um, the uh, next seminars and the past seminars and, uh, and um, and uh, so much more at our fingertips with the new with the new uh, uh, website. Thank you, everyone.